Hello everyone, welcome to Open Source Code. This is the fourth video in the Guru slash Linux tutorial series. In this video, we are going to see the actual installation process. Before the installation process, I would like to discuss few things that are uh, important before you start your actual installation. Certain concepts are there. So, without further delay, let us start the discussion about the installation process. Okay, so the first thing what we need is a computer. Hopefully, all of you are uh, ready with the setup. As I said, you need a machine which is having a processor which is 1 gigahertz or above. You need you need around 1 GB of RAM or above, you need around 10 GB of hard drive space or more. 10 GB as it specified earlier is required for the basic installation. If you plan to download and work a lot of this, you will be needing a lot more space. So it is recommended that you give more and more space for Linux installation. Second, if you have already watched my video, earlier videos, you might have already downloaded the ISO as well as you might have verified it. So, after the second step, you probably have also written it to a USB or a CD DVD according to your requirements. In our installation process, we have already written it to a USB pen drive. So, write to USB, the image. Okay, so with these things ready in hand, our basic needs are done. The next step before you proceed, which is going to be really important, is the backup. Backup of your data. Okay, again, I am giving the fair warning. You cannot hold me responsible if anything goes wrong and you lose your existing data. Please back up your data before you proceed. Also, please verify the backup. It's a very important step. If your backup is messed up, then now, other thing that you need to know before you go ahead is you need to find out how to get into your BIOS and set the boot priority or the modern BIOS or U, UEFI uh, systems, they, they allow you to choose the bootable device without actually entering the BIOS system and permanently making that changes. So just uh, do a search on the net how to get into the BIOS. Like for example, the machine I am going to use is an ASUS laptop in which I can get into the uh, boot priority without getting into the BIOS is by pressing the escape key. Another thing to note is please write it down behind your laptop or at a safe location. Okay. So this is my laptop and here I have written with a permanent marker what key gets me where. Please do this. This is going to be very helpful. It's going to reduce a lot of frustration. Otherwise, your machine will boot four or five times into the regular OS and you'll get frustrated unnecessarily. Okay. Now, we'll be seeing the later on process over here. So, what are the steps that are involved in installing a Linux operating system or rather GNU slash Linux operating system or any particular distribute, distribution to say so. Though we are going to see the process of installation 
of Linux Mint, the process of installation is more or less same in all the distributions. Okay. So, what are the steps? Few steps, the basic preparation we have already done. The other steps that are involved are after booting, you need to do certain things like, so usually the first step would be select a language, select a language in which you want to install the system. Then usually you are asked to select the keyboard, select and check, select and check your keyboard. In certain cases you might be prompted with the GNU GPL license, you have to accept that of course. And the most important step in the installation process is about the partitioning. So I will just discuss about the partitioning so that you get the concept how it is done. Because in Linux type systems we don't have the concept of C colon, D colon or drive mechanism. Everything is represented under a directory and the partitions are named separately. We will go into the detail and other understanding in some other videos, but for the time being, let's try to understand what exactly uh, this partitioning is required for and how it can be done. So, when you have a computer, a Linux system is going to look at your hard drives as a different device. Okay you will not get to see it like how you see it on Windows. So, usually, nowadays, in the newer systems, your hard drive, the first hard drive attached, will be referred as SDA. Just for your information, this will be the location of the hard drive when you have installed your system. So, SDA is the name given to the first hard drive, complete device. Second, if you have a second device, then it will be SDB, SDC, SDD and so on. Whenever you connect a pen drive or something, it takes up the next name. Now, if this drive is further partitioned, it is given names as SDA1, SD. A2 and so on. One important aspect to understand is, oh, not sad, SDA2. So, one important aspect to understand is SDA1 to SDA4 are reserved for primary partitions and after this all the numbers are reflecting the extended partitions or partitions in the extended location. Now, in our scenario, most probably you have the hard drive as SDA and most probably it might be looking something like this. So, this is my complete hard drive and if you have already an existing operating system installed on it, you are probably having this as SDA1, some partition taking, taking up some space, another partition taking up some space, this will be SDA2. Now probably if it is Windows, it might also show up as SDA5. The 2, 3 and 4 might not show up. So don't, uh, don't worry about it, no problem with that. Primarily, they will be numbered like this. So, for the time being, I will assume SDA1, SDA2, SDA3. Okay. So, in your Windows representation, this could be C colon, this would be D colon and this would be E colon. Fine. Now, before installing, either you use some tool in Windows and Resize or delete this partition to make enough of space available. 
you need to clear up the data on this. Windows has some utility with which you can resize it. Okay. Once you have resized the partition, we will have enough of space. So either if you have deleted this partition, this will be our free space. Okay, and this is what we are going to use for installation. So your Windows or existing operating system remains here and our new operating system will be installed here and we will be making the partitions for that operating system in this particular location. Fine? Okay. Now, once we will reach this step during the installation, where we have either free space or if you decide to use the tool from the installation itself, it's up to you, but we will be needing free space. Okay? So, in this free space to install Linux, we will be making certain partitions. Fine? So, Linux, you can make a single partition to install everything on that or there is always, it is always recommended that we make certain amount of partitions. The partitioning scheme itself is a complex task if you are looking in terms of setting up servers, web servers, mail servers and others. But this tutorial is an initial part. So we will just stick to a simple partitioning scheme where we are going to make only three partitions. Okay. So what are the three partitions that we want to make? The first partition that we would we will make is we'll create a space where the operating system files will reside. Okay. So our operating system, if you install everything from that, will require around 4 to 5 GB of space. We should have space for temporary files and other kind of stuff. So at the least 10 GB and if you don't want to reinstall and do all the things again and again, give it a huge chunk of around 15 to 20 GB. So let us say we will first make a partition of 10 GB. This partition will be accessible via slash which is called as root. These are also referred as mount points. Mount point to access this partition. You can roughly take an analogy when you click on D in Windows, you get to access this partition. So when you access slash, you will get to access this partition, whatever you have created. So let us say I have given 10 GB to my root partition. So this is also referred as the root partition. Fine. The next I want to create is called as a swap partition. The swap may not be required in today's scenario if you have a lot of RAM. But if you decide to suspend to disk and so on, it's always a fair game to have a swap partition. Swap, as a rule of thumb, earlier used to be twice the RAM size when we used to have RAM like 128 MB, 256 MB. Of course, some people might say, Are ye toh zyada ho gaya. So, it varies. But when I started, it was 128 to 56. So the rule of thumb said that make it twice. But now we have RAM like 2 GB, 4 GB. So just make it equivalent to the amount of RAM plus say 500 MB more to be on the safer side. So we will make another partition which will be called as swap. Okay. This will be 2x of RAM plus 500 MB. Fine. The idea is if you say suspend to disk or hibernate, then we should have enough of swap space to take a snapshot over there. Last one we want to create is a home partition. Linux is going to be a multi-user system and every user will get a directory inside this home partition where they will be allowed to keep their content. In Linux, you are not allowed to keep your content here, there, everywhere, mix up with the operating system. So, 
having a separate home partition is very important even if you are the only user on the system will still make a home partition even if you don't make it it will automatically turn up but we will make a home partition and this home partition is supposed to be uh, you can decide on how many users are there into the amount of disk space that you want to provide I am considering right now that you are the only user and you are going to have a lot of uh, data which you will be downloading let us say some videos are there probably you are doing some graphics work and all so you can decide how much space you want to give but we will just give the remaining space to it it could be anywhere from like 20 GB to 100 GB whatever you want the remaining will be given to this and this partition will be mounted on slash home ok so any user that will be created uh, that user's directory will be home slash so if my login id is dexter this is going to be my home directory and inside this only will I be able to keep my content ok so this is the basic overview for how we are going to do this now when you are making these partitions you will also need to select a file system just like on windows you have fat32, ntfs and so on there are n number of file systems available some are coming up some are uh, old one some are stable some are good from my experience what I have seen is ext4 is a good file system for the time being so the file system which we are going to use for root and home is going to be ext4 ok you might get an option of butterfs or written as btrfs fine so we will stick to this file systems for root and home swap doesn't require a file system it is automatically done by the installation so we never access the swap directly as a user so hope this gives you a bit of understanding as how to partition your hard drive for the installation process now uh, one thing I missed is if you are going to you are having a newer system which has a UEFI BIOS or UEFI rather you will need to create an EFI partition now in most of the cases if windows is installed there would be a EFI partition over here already and it will get mounted automatically and the system will use it if you don't have anything do create a EFI partition as the first partition when you are installing this should be around 512 MB ok so these are the things that you need to keep in mind while doing the installation now once you proceed with this double check whatever you have done and then only accept the further uh, partitioning once the partition is written you cannot revert back so be careful at this point after this depending upon the distribution you are using you may be given a choice to select the different softwares or you may not be given a choice to select different softwares you might be given choices to set up the network set up the firewall, set up different hardware and other things so uh, those are generic things uh, one recommendation is there please read the notes, pop-ups and instructions given during the installation read them carefully don't be in a hurry when you are doing the installation we have plenty of time ok so after going all through this depending upon the distributions you may be asked to set up a user who is going to use the system 
So you have to give the username, you have to set the password. So please set the username and password and don't forget it. Okay, once you forget it, if you are a new user, it will become very difficult for you to reset the password. So whatever mechanism you want to use, make sure you don't forget the password. Fine. Second, in certain distributions, the root user account root is the administrator on the Linux system who has complete access to the system. This user is activated and the password for the root user is to be set. So you need to set the password for the root user also and in many of the scenarios to do system level administrative work installing for the software and all you will need to give the root password. Okay. So whatever password you set for the user or root, please don't forget it. As I said, use any mechanism, make sure you can, you have the password when it comes to log in into the system. So once this is set, uh, the most common softwares will be installed into your system and then you will be able to use your system. Okay. So this is the basic intro how to go ahead with the installation process. After this, we will see the actual uh, recording of how the install takes place. So let's go ahead and start the installation process. I have my ISO ready verified and my pen drive is also ready.